All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I have to present this lecture like this because of the camera, right? So we have some objective circumstances, let me say. Um, so today's lecture will be dedicated to... I hope you can see it, right? Is it okay? Thank you. So, uh, today's lecture will be dedicated to the premises of revival of the ancient ideal of science of beauty. Uh, as far as you remember, we have already discussed the questions concerning the problem of definition, what is science and what is philosophy in different epochs and, uh, well, actually in different uh, parts of the world, in different cultures and so forth. I have to remind you that uh, we're speaking only in terms of European tradition because uh, the general feeling about that, the general concept about philosophy is that it is completely and unique Greek I uh, idea. Right? So we, we are not going to discuss any Chinese, any Indian, or any other pieces of wisdom, right? because they're not really philosophy. So uh, this is just a kind of convention. right? Uh, speaking about the authors, I have to say that the main person here uh, who established this view was Ge uh, Georg Hegel. And, uh, he was so influential that this convention has been adopted. So still that, still the first part of the 19th century, we're not speaking about the Chinese or the Arab uh, philosophy as such, but only the implications of these possible philosophizing uh, concerning the influence on the European tradition. So for instance, uh, today we are going to speak about the renaissance that occurred in uh, Europe after the Middle Ages. So you remember that we speak about Middle Ages in terms of fall of Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Rome. So that, was, uh, that took place in 1453. And uh, of course, we have to say some words about uh, those people who commented on Aristotle's works. We have to say, we have to mention the, uh, those who developed the medicine, for example, Avicenna and Averroes, you, you understand that. But again, I have to remind you that we are, we are speaking about them only in terms of the influence on European tradition, right? So this is crucial because uh, otherwise we will not get the complete idea of the development of philosophy as such, as a certain cultural phenomenon. So I would like to emphasize this, so that we consider philosophy to be the unique European phenomenon, right? Um, so, the general agenda for today is that we have three questions to discuss, three issues to discuss. The first is the general re uh, review of the Renaissance as a certain and unique epoch in the history of ideas and history of Europe as such. The second point is that uh, we have to discuss the humanism and reformation as certain steps or, if you wish, levels, um, because the Renaissance uh, is only the threshold of uh, the modern age uh, and a very important stage uh, when we have the first adaptation of the concepts and actually the, uh, the occurrence, right, the appearance of the concepts that will be developed later uh, in the works of Descartes and uh, Bacon and uh, many other philosophers of the modern era. Uh, that is why it is important to discuss also some social uh, circumstances of that, such as Reformation. And finally, number three will be dedicated to the premises of the rise of experimental knowledge, because you understand that the classical science, as we understand it, I mean the science of Newton and uh, Descartes and Galileo, of course, has the basis of experiment, right? So uh, the, very fun, uh, the very fundamental idea for classical uh, physics, for classical chemistry, for classical uh, astronomy and so forth, this, uh, the idea of optical centrism, and I would uh, discuss this idea a bit later. But uh, the, implica the implication of that, it, of the point that to see is to know, and vice versa, uh, we will find in the experiment of modern age. So, that, that is why it is very important to discuss the phenomenon of Renaissance uh, separately. So, uh, Concerning the general review of the Renaissance, we have first of all to say that the very term of Renaissance was coined by Jules Michelet, the French thinker and uh, 
he was a thinker of conservative wing, let me say. And uh, you see that he lived in the 19th century, and that was really the piece of uh, the uh, period of time when the very idea of Renaissance was discussed very thoroughly. And he was one who coined this concept as a characteristics of a certain period of time for his thought that we have to divide really the Middle Ages and the modern age, not because of their premises of a certain idea of art or maybe science or uh, the idea of Catholic Church or anything like that, but the very idea of um, the, let me say, keywords, the key concepts that, ha uh, that were, uh, were developed uh, during this short, uh, well, uh, comparatively short uh, period of time. So we are speaking about only three centuries. The second main person who also uh, developed this idea was Jakob Bockert, actually the Swiss scholar. In, in 1860, he published his famous book, The Culture of Italy in uh, the Epoch of Renaissance. And uh, he was very influential in this field because, for example, Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the most famous and influential philosophers of the 19th century, uh, was uh, he focused on this book and focused on this author and uh, he really said that Jakob Bochert was one of the most uh, attentive, let me say, right, and accurate uh, scholar and uh, analyst who really studied the material properly. Uh, also, it provoked the whole development of uh, cultural studies and you know that the very field of cultural studies was elaborated in the beginning, well, actually in the first part of the 20th century, first of all by uh, Mr. Leslie White, who coined the term and just dropped the mark, uh, the mark the line uh, between philosophy and cultural studies and ethnology and different other things. So, uh, Bookhead also is famous for uh, his investigations into uh, the field of cultural studies. But speaking about the very idea of Renaissance, we have to mention the person who really elaborated the very word. So he was Francesco Petrarch, uh, a famous Italian author and poet who is famous for his uh, scholarship, uh, for his papers uh, in classics, in classical, in classic studies. And of course, as a poet, so he wrote to his Madonna Laura, and uh, he's famous for his sonnets. Um, so Francesco Petrarch actually was the first who named the period of the, uh, from the 6th up to the 10th centuries uh, when actually the Middle Ages, as we name them now, took place as the Dark Ages. So this is the common term for this period of time. And the idea of his was to focus upon literature and culture of classical antiquity. So when he spoke about these Dark Ages, he meant that nothing actually happened. So this is a usual, uh, how do you say, uh, a usual um, thing that people uh, really, that people realize that uh, Middle Ages gave their own uh, civilization, gave their own culture, and they were the Romanticists who first understood that the Middle Ages were really uh, interesting as such, as a certain period of time. But uh, as a prejudice, it's also very influential nowadays. So when we speak about um, Middle Ages now, we usually mean, first of all, the, those things that actually never took place there. For example, usually they say, so what do you think about the Middle Ages? What do you know about Middle Ages? So what are your associations? Usually people say, Holy Inquisition, right? Uh, the bonfires, then uh, they speak about the uh, separate the opposition between the Catholic Church and the experimental science, but actually this are, these are the phenomena which took place in the Renaissance, not the Middle Ages, right? So that is why we have to understand this phenomenon very clearly, also in terms of cultural studies and social uh, circumstances. And the last person right now whom I would like to uh, mention would be Giorgio Vasari, the Italian uh, artist and sculpture, 
who in the, 70, in the 16th century first characterized the Renaissance as a period of revival of ancient ideal of art and beauty. So you understand that uh, the classic art of the the classical art of the ancient Greece and ancient Rome were completely uh, abandoned, let me say, right, uh, in the period of uh, Middle Ages because they were pagan. So the pagan civilization could not be adopted in terms of Christianity, which really spread through the whole Europe, and only centuries later speaking strictly 10 centuries later, uh, there appeared people who focused on this ideal of beauty and art, and first of all, an, uh, anthropocentrism. We have discussed this uh, concept and we will discuss it once again. Because you remember that uh, this culture, uh, I mean the Asian sculpture and uh, Asian poetry, Asian philosophy, meant uh, the human being uh, as a, a certain ideal, right? So, um, when we speak about body, I mean, the, uh, the man, the human body, in, t uh, in terms of uh, art or any ancient ideal, we think that it's really ideal, it's very beautiful, right? So we just can remember some sculptures that we know from the ancient time, the times of antiquity. A bit later I will just give you the The example, right, the instance of um, the medieval art, just to compare the very different approaches to art as such, and we will try to uh, understand the difference between the very uh, definition of art and the very understanding of this, right? Uh, I mean, in Middle Ages and in the Renaissance. So here we have to, first of all, we have to define for stages of the Renaissance as a certain period of time. Uh, here we can see the pre-Renaissance part. So this, is, uh, this took place in the second half of the 13th century and the 14th century. Let me remind you that the great Italian poet Dante Alighieri uh, was born in 1265 and died in uh, 1321. So usually they say that he was the last poet of the Middle Ages and the first poet of modern time. So this characteristic traces back to a famous German thinker, uh, Friedrich Engels, and actually this is a commonplace uh, in the cultural studies and history of art and literature. That is why we mean that pre-Renaissance took part, first of all, in Italy of, uh, uh, the, th uh, of the beginning of the th or 14th century. Here we also can mention a famous Giotto di Bandone, uh, a famous artist and uh, architect who was also very influential in terms of the art program that he elaborated uh, and of course the linear perspective which we will discuss a bit later. The second stage and the second actually uh, level, the second period of the Renaissance is so-called early Renaissance uh, which, take, which took place in the beginning of the 15th and the end of the uh, 15th century. Uh, this was actually the time when uh, the main ideas, the main program, let me say, of uh, artistic approach to art really uh, took, this, uh, took its paramount, right? Re uh, reached its paramount. Then we have, we have so-called High Renaissance, and this is the end of the 15th and the two first decades of the 16th century. So uh, this was the time when the titans, when the geniuses of the Renaissance really uh, lived and worked, such as Leonardo and Michelangelo and other people. And finally, we have late so-called late Renaissance, which took part in mid, uh, of this, in uh, the mid 16th century and the 90s of the same century, when uh, we find really the threshold of uh, two periods, right? A kind of uh, a border between two periods. So this is the time when actually the uh, Renaissance epoch finished and the time when the modernity was born. So you see the 16th century, let me remind you that uh, the first uh, world, uh, the first circumnavigation uh, under Magellanus uh, finished in uh, 1521, uh, sorry, 1522. 
Uh, and this is actually when people understood that the world is completely different from what they used to think, right? Because the very uh, maps, the very uh, worldview was very influenced by Ptolemy and the ancient, uh, ancient uh, map designers, uh, such as Strabo, for example. Uh, we will discuss this topic a bit later, probably the next lecture, but we have to understand that this period of time was very crucial in terms of history of ideas and the very cultural development of uh, the European man. So, here I have the quotation uh, from a very interesting book, actually it is not translated into Russian, oh sorry, into English, so it's only in Russian, but it was written by the professor Konstantin Andreevich Sergeyev, uh, the professor of philosophy uh, in, who lived in St. Petersburg. Uh, and his great book, The Renaissance Foundation of Anthropocentrism, uh, we can find this interesting quotation, so let me just read it. Renaissance indeed becomes, so to say, a laboratory for considering the perspectives and trends of our time, because it is not only the premise of Cartesian rationality, but its overcoming as well. So, as we have already said, this threshold uh, of two crucial epochs uh, from the point of view of our own rationality and classical science as such really uh, demands uh, a thorough discussion, right, which we have to do right now. And I, might, uh, I would also like to emphasize this Cartesian rationality, the premise of Cartesian rationality, because uh, Cartesian, uh, well, Descartes as such, uh, was of course the person who knew the medieval tradition very well, but still he tried to orient, not to, he tried to focus uh, as the instances of his own works, not uh, on the medieval thought, not the medieval tradition, but uh, the tradition of Aristotle as such, right? Which is completely different, actually. So, here we have the main ideas of the Renaissance, and point uh, one is, of course, the anthrop uh, anthropocentrism. We have already discussed this uh, concept, and I would like to remind what does it mean. Uh, I would like just to speak about the volume of this concept. So, first of all, we mean, by this, we mean that a human being is a, micro uh, is a microcosm in a macrocosm. So, what does this mean? Actually, this concept was very well elaborated by a modern thinker, Max Schellen, uh, who, who really established uh, the whole discipline in philosophy as uh, the philosophical anthropology. That was the very beginning, the 20s, uh, the 20s of the 20th century. And he also took this concept of microcosm in a macrocosm. Uh, the idea is the following. So each person is a universe, a very unique, and separated universe from any other people. So each of us has our own talents. We are all geniuses, but we have to develop our genius and we have to develop our talents. That is why to understand what is man means to become a man. So actually this is something, uh, it, it is a bit close to the Nietzschean demand for a superman. You remember that Nietzsche said that the superman actually uh, has the same distance from a man as man has the distance from the ape, right? So, what does it mean to be a man in terms of anthropocentrism? First of all, we mean that there is a certain idea of humanitas. So, hence, we have the concept of humanism, which is not the same as we have the idea of humanism nowadays. So, what do we mean by humanism nowadays? Uh, usually, we mean that, uh, for example, if we speak that this is not, uh, well, we know that uh, people uh, make mistakes, right? We know that we are not ideal, we are not perfect. So in terms of this, we say that humanism is a kind of attitude which considers this uh, kind of imperfect, uh, imperfect um, traits of a human being. But this is completely different, and I would even say opposite to what really the Renaissance thinkers thought, because the idea of humanities actually meant that each person has, uh, well, must, not should, but must develop his talents in order to become a man. So man becomes a project. 
we are not born uh, as men. We have to elaborate uh, ourselves. We have to become men, right? And that is why they thought that the very life is a project, uh, an aesthetical even project. So uh, life becomes a kind of a genre of art, right? So actually, later uh, when the Romantic era co uh, will come, we will find the idea of Gesamtkustwer, as they put it in Italian, or the idea of total piece of art, the total work of art, uh, which, meant, which means that uh, we can combine different attitudes and different genres of art. For example, like Beethoven did it in the, his famous Ninth, Saint, uh, Ninth Symphony. When you remember that in the fifth movement he has also the, uh, the choir, right? Uh, so-called Ode an die Freude, right? So Ode to Joy, written by Schiller. And it's not only the symphonic music as such, the instrumental music as such, but we also hear the choir. So this is a first attempt of combination of different genres of art in one. So this is uh, the first instance of the idea of Gesamtkustwerk, or the total work of art. Something like that, uh, really, the humanists meant when they say that life is also a kind of genre of art, that life is also the aesthetic project. And um, we also have to mean that uh, after they discovered the ancient ideal of scholarship and art, uh, of course, it provoked a kind of riot against dogmatic authority, primarily of the Catholic Church, and the imitation of the ancient culture, actually the Latin, the ancient Greek. For example, uh, one of the most influential scholars of uh, the Renaissance era, Erasmus of Rotterdam, really could not answer to the question, uh, what is his nation? So, what is his nationality? He, of course, the concept of nation and the concept of nationality uh, was coined in the late 18th century, when they, they became the idea that it is possible to establish the uh, national country, the national state, for example, like uh, all the Russians live in Russia, this is just the example, right? Or all the Germans live in Germany, right? But that was the kind of a project of a uh, late, uh, later time. So he, uh, when Erasmus said, so who am I, right? He asked himself, who am I? He couldn't really give the answer because he was born in Rotterdam and that was the Flemish part of the Netherlands, right? Uh, he, didn't see, he didn't think himself uh, as a Dutch, he didn't think himself as an Englishman or a Frenchman. Some people say that the best answer possible to this question, so what was the nationality of Erasmus of Rotterdam, would be ancient Greece or Rome, because those were the languages which he wrote, right? This was the culture which, uh, he went, uh, where he really felt himself at home. And that is why this becomes a concept. So, to uh, deliver this kind of scholarship, to run this kind of scholarship, means to understand ourselves at home. So that is why antiquity really becomes the foundation, the basis, and actually the home of the modern man. So Hegel will say that we feel ourselves at home in the age of modernity, right? And here is a, again uh, the quotation from Sergei's book, The Renaissance Foundation of Anthropocentrism. So I would like to quote it once, uh, once again because this is the illustration of my thesis uh, of, my, uh, thesis of uh, the foundation right, of uh, the modern time. So a man of Renaissance realized himself a successor of brilliant antiquity. And I would like to emphasize the word realize because when we, have the period, when we are in the period of, more, of Middle Ages, people did not realize themselves the, the successors. They understood that their, completely, their world is completely opposite to the one of the antiquity. So, and in its imitation, he did his best to be an artist in life as such. That is why he put in forward the aesthetics of existence, and he revived the aesthetic cosmos, or space, of the ancient first of all, making an, oppo uh, an opposing uh, uh, making an opposing it to the ethic universe of the Church Fathers. So, when we discuss the works of the Church Fathers, first of all we see that uh, the, the main idea uh, which they tried to present in their studies was that each person has its own ethical 
uh, prejudice or oh, sorry uh, ethic, um, ethical mm. oh goodness uh, so God knows everything about us right that means that we have to act and we have to live as if everything uh, as we are observed right as, as if God observes each house each us uh, our step so that is why our thinking and our way of life is primarily ethical so in the, in the Renaissance era there becomes <clears throat> a different thesis that we really have to live an aesthetic way of life and finally it really finds its attitude to as I have already said uh, to life and to the piece or the, the works of art in the project of Gesamtwerk in Romantic era so who are those people who created actually Renaissance so here we have uh, some figures and I would uh, uh, I try to divide them into three groups so the artists the scientists and the scholars so here we first we have Donato di Nicola di Bettobardi uh, whom we know as Donatello uh, he's famous for elaborating the idea of linear perspective uh, you know that in the art of icons the art of Middle Ages the perspective was different and we will see the examples a bit later in this presentation so Donatello was uh, probably one of the first people who tried to picture the, uh, to, who tried to depict things as they appear in life not as we think they are uh, as symbols so uh, you remember probably the Egyptian art where the pharaohs or the main priests or just important generals of course are bigger than uh, the usual soldiers, right? Uh, just people uh, who act, right? Uh, and we see them just with big size. Uh, the same idea we had in, uh, for example, in the medieval island, when they thought that the holy people, the saints, and even Jesus Christ uh, were the giants. Just, it comes, it, it traces back to the Irish uh, myths when in Irish mythology, when they, they thought that the gods and the heroes and, the, uh, well, even the giants must be of big size, right? Because they are main uh, characters of the, myth, uh, of the myths. Uh, that is why they thought that Christ was a, a huge man, right? So, uh, like, a kind of uh, artistic attitude to this uh, Christian authority. Donatello was the person who tried to uh, depict things as they really appear in life and he was one of the first people once again who uh, elaborated the idea of linear perspective so the second person is famous Leonardo da Vinci or simply Leonardo uh, this is not a person whom I must um, introduce to you because everybody knows about his activity and his genius so he is probably the uh, paramount one of the paramounts of the uh, Renaissance and of course, probably the best example of uh, the perfect man, of genius, right? When you think about uh, Leonardo, we of course think not about his um, Gioconda or his uh, pictures, right? Madonna Lita or something like that. We also think about his uh, inventions. We think about him as a certain, um, a certain really aspect, a certain instance, right? Of the whole Renaissance period, so of course he is. He could pro, uh, his example could probably illustrate our idea of humanity. That person must become a man as a certain project of life. The next person is Michelangelo Buonarroti, or simply Michelangelo, uh, who was not only the sculpture, the famed sculpture, uh, whom we know by his famous David, but also one of the creators of the Vatican City and the whole. Uh, mm, the whole cathedral, St. Peter's Cathedral, the biggest uh, Christian uh, cathedral in the world. The next person is Raphael Sanzi, or simply Raphael, uh, who was also the architect and the painter and who finished the project of uh, the Vatican along with Brunelleschi, but uh, still he really elaborated the idea of the linear perspective, probably the best after his uh, famous uh, mentor and famous master Perugino, 
he actually uh, established this tradition of depiction or, or of depicting uh, the reality as such. And we will also try to give the examples. And finally, uh, uh, two men from so-called uh, Northern Renaissance. Uh, this is Albrecht Dürer. And here is a very interesting portrait. So Albrecht Dürer uh, is famous for his paintings uh, and his uh, engra uh, engravings. So uh, this self-portrait was made in... Uh, was made in... Uh, you don't have it, right? I, I, sorry, yeah, excuse me. So uh, this self-portrait uh, was done in uh, 1500. And actually, this is one of the first examples of depiction of a person in front, on fuss. Because uh, there used to be a rule that the only person, the only character that could be depicted on fuss is Christ, Jesus Christ. And we can only see him on uh, the, watching uh, the person from the icon. So, Albrecht Dürer was the first person who depicted himself uh, on fuss as Christ. And actually, he never showed that and he never published this uh, self-portrait uh, in time of his life. And uh, actually, this is, one, this is very symbol, uh, symbolical because, as you remember, as we have already said, the human beings, well, the people of the Renaissance understood themselves as the projects. That is why it is also in, um, an important trait of that period of time is self-portrait. So here we have the self-portrait of Raphael as well, his famous self-portrait, a very influential piece of art. Uh, and actually these pictures show us not only the appearance of a person, but also a certain um, message. What does it mean to be an artist and what does it mean to be a man? Because different self-portraits and different portraits as such really show different people in different, part, uh, in different stages of their life. And finally, we have to mention Hans Holbein the Younger. Uh, he was the one who left a lot of portraits of his famous contemporaries. For instance, uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam, also Thomas More, or um, the Tudor family, of course, Henry VIII. Um, and maybe you remember his famous piece of, uh, well, his famous picture, uh, Christ in Grave, oh, sorry, Christ in Coffin in tune, right? So there we can see uh, the corpse of a man, not the god, because, well, you remember that there was a usual genre of, um, a common genre in uh, the art of Renaissance, which called the Pietà, and uh, this usually depicts a very uh, solemn and misery, uh, well, miserable, let me say, uh, scene, uh, when the Christ was taken from the cross, and we can see usually the John, the ba uh, John, uh, the Revelator, and uh, Saint Mary, who hold Christ on their hands, and this is something very solemn, right? This is something that shows us the attitude to the God. So this is really the savior of the world, right? In terms of Christianity, so Hans Holbein really depicted Jesus as a man, and he just put the corpse uh, as the main character of his picture. Dostoevsky, when he saw this uh, art in, um, in Germany, he put it in his famous novel, The Idiot, where, uh, Count, uh, where Prince Mishkin discusses this uh, with one of the characters, and he says that if one uh, uh, sees this uh, portrait of Christ in tune, uh, the, portrait of this, uh, the picture of this corpse, he will uh, lose his belief. He will never believe in God, right? Because we see not the savior of the world, not the concept of man, but really the corpse as such. So these are people who really made the, uh, so they elaborated the artistic attitude to life as such and made their crucial impact in the history of art in terms of, of Renaissance uh, period of time. So, speaking about the uh, famous scholars, we have to mention Giovanni Pico della Mirandola, the person who uh, is famous for establishing the idea of humanism, the idea of uh, humanities, and he really was the person who uh, defended 900 theses um, on 
the idea of renaissance of that a human being is a microcosm and a macrocosm. Uh, the next important person is uh, the one I have already mentioned today, Rasmus of Rotterdam. This is, by the way, the portrait of his uh, done by Hans Holbein, the younger. And it's quite interesting. So here, uh, I hope you can see it. So here, there is the inscription in ancient Greek, Herakle uh, Ponoi, which actually meant the labor of, Her uh, of uh, Heracles. So, what does it mean? It means, first of all, that Erasmus was the person who developed the classics, the field of classical studies. So nowadays we know that the classics is one of the most important branches in philology. And Erasmus was the one who gave the impulse to the whole discipline and the whole field. And he established, the, he laid the very fundament along with um, John Ryken and uh, Thomas More and different other people who started the uh, classic thought. But he is also the person who first published the critical issues of the of New Testament and some works of St. Fathers, for example, uh, the works of uh, uh, St. Geronimus. It was very important because you know that Vulgata, actually the uh, variant of Latin Bible, was very badly written. And when we speak about the scholarship in uh, the Middle Ages, we say that uh, those who spoke, uh, for example, the medieval Greek, they, tra they tried to write the classic Greek, but it was completely different to the language they really spoke. So this is something the same as we had, for example, in the Russian tradition uh, until Pushkin, when the speaking language and the written language were completely different, right? You know that uh, nowadays sometimes it is very hard even for the native speakers of English to read Shakespeare, uh, not to say about, for example, uh, Ben Johnson, right, or uh, Christopher Marlowe, or different other representatives of the Renaissance era period of time, or if we especially speak about Chaucer, so this is completely different language, right? So we have to adopt uh, the Shakespearean language uh, to our contemporary English. So this is something really Erasmus did. So he made the study of the classics possible and he elaborated the whole, the whole discipline of the classics. Here's his friend, Sir Thomas More, and uh, he was the Lord, the, uh, the Lord Mayor of London, the city of London, under Henry VIII. You remember the tradition says that, uh, he, well, he was actually canonized and uh, sometimes they say that he is Saint Sir Thomas More because he, was, he refused to uh, consider the king to be the head of church. Uh, you remember that the, in the Protestant tradition, uh, Henry VIII decided to become uh, more important to the Christians, uh, I mean to uh, the English Christians than the Pope. Right? And now we have the, uh, a certain uh, Anglican church, which is completely different to, uh, for example, uh, the Lutheran church, right, or the Calvin church, or anything like that. So Thomas More really defended the faith, and he's the defender of faith, of the Catholic faith. And uh, he also uh, is famous as uh, the saint man, right, the person who really uh, refused to recognize the king to be uh, to have a higher position than the Pope. Also, Thomas More is famous for his book uh, about Utopia. You remember that Utopia uh, was actually the island, uh, and from ancient Greek we could translate it in two ways. First of all, we say that you in uh, ancient Greek is good, right, or well, uh, and topos in ancient Greek means place, so uh, the best place, a good place. Uh, so this is actually the idea that utopia is the most uh, just, oh, sorry, is the justice, right? Uh, and uh, probably the best organized state ever in the world. Uh, and so this is the conversation between the travelers from distant parts so for, for, who came back from uh, a great navigation and now they would like to tell other people about the discovery of utopia. Uh, the next idea is utopia of utopia uh, could be uh, 
uh, that it's not the best place, right? Uh, but also nowhere, right? Because it actually, we can never find really the just state. This is the idea of Plato. So we can uh, think only, uh, uh, we can only think about the just state, uh, the justice as such, but we can never find uh, the just ruler, right? Uh, we can never find the state where uh, people really feel themselves um, in defense of laws and so forth, because we also have uh, different aspects of uh, our life and different situations when law is not able to defend us, right? So, in these terms, uh, Sir Thomas More is one of the most influential writers of the Renaissance, who wrote very good Latin, and he actually established the whole genre of uh, utopia. And you remember that in the 20th century we even have the phenomenon of dystopia, right? Something which is completely opposite to the utopian period of time when... Uh, so, it's quite interesting, in the beginning of the modern age, people really thought that it is possible to uh, found the uh, just state, the just country, uh, well, under the, uh, I, under the idea of, ra uh, of reason, right? So our reason make this uh, just state of things possible. By the end of the 20th century, so uh, actually in the middle of the 20th century, so by the end of the modern era, we lose, uh, well, people lose this idea. People lose this optimism and they say that, no, our reason only brings us to something very sad and unjust, right? So that is why the phenomenon of dystopia is also very characteristic in terms of modern age. The next person whom we have to mention is Niccolo Machiavelli. Uh, I think that you know him very well. So he was the one who wrote uh, the influential books, uh, The Prince, and of course, the uh, history of Florence, and also the meditation upon the first decade of Titus Livius, so uh, of Titus Le uh, Titus Livius, uh, he really was the one whom we can say uh, who established, uh, who, who, who laid the foundation, laid the basis of uh, of the modern political science. Of course, he was not alone, but at the same time, he was probably one of the most influential thinkers whose works are really topical nowadays. So, uh, the next person whom we have to mention is, of course, Nicholas Copernicus, the, uh, the man who uh, made the first scientific revolution possible. You remember that there is concept, concept of uh, different scientific revolutions, when we ha which we have three, actually. So, Copernicus was the one who provoked the first revolution when he said that heliocentric system uh, is the truth and the geocentric system of Ptolemy is actually something that uh, that cannot fit anymore, right? Just because we have mathematics and physics and uh, uh, our knowledge has developed uh, dramatically uh, in terms of the possibility um, of theoretical explanation of our position in the universe, right? So we will discuss Copernicus a bit later and finally here is the person who was one of the most brilliant, let me say, uh, representative of uh, the Renaissance thought. Actually, he was more a philosopher than the astronomer probably or the scientist as such. Giordano Bruno, who died, well, who was actually burned under the Holy Inquisition. Under, well, he was condemned to be burned, uh, to be burned uh, by the Holy Inquisition in 1600 in so-called uh, Piazza di Flore. Uh, in Rome, which actually the square of flowers, and nowadays we have a great monument to him. So uh, it was. It, it's just very interesting how this monument was uh, in, um, erected. So Giordano Bruno was considered to be one of the most important three thinkers uh, in the history of human thought. So uh, in the end of the 18th, of the 19th century. People, uh, especially Freemasons, um, who really wanted to show that they are not afraid that they shall overcome the founder of Catholic Church, uh, they just um, 
got some money, right? They just raised the funds, raised the funds to erect this monument to a famous Sri Finca. And uh, it was done in the uh, end of the 19th century. So uh, nowadays, this is from that time and up to nowadays, uh, Piazza de Flore uh, actually the, uh, is the place where most important three thinkers of present times, the famous a a a a atheists, uh, the famous um, people who try to struggle right, uh, against Catholic Church and uh, different uh, prejudice, uh, prejudice of, um, of nowadays, right? so uh, those who stand for scientific tradition, they gather together there and they find uh, that it is really probably the best place and probably uh, very symbolical uh, in terms of uh, the very activity and the very works of Giordano Bruno. So, uh, after this short review, we have to focus on the idea of humanism and reformation. So, here we have the three, uh, three uh, the scheme uh, divided into three parts of poetry, rhetoric, and science. And we have to understand what do we mean by that. So, I have already mentioned Dante Alighieri, who actually uh, is considered to be the first poet of the, middle, oh, sorry, of, uh, the modern age. And usually they say that his divine comedy opens or starts the tradition of modern and Renaissance literature. So, uh, in his divine comedy, we find the world system, as you remember, this is just a codus, right, where we see uh, nine levels of hell, then we have the purgatory, and step by step, right, level by level, we climb up. Uh, to the heaven, to the paradise, uh, which has also different levels and different heavens. And this was actually the idea, I think we discussed that last time, so that was the idea of the medieval world. So the hierarchical world where everything is just sub the idea of subordin uh, subordination dom um, really dominated, right? So you remember that the king or the pope took the very first level, then they, uh, they went the nobility, the higher priests, right? For example, the archbishops or uh, the cardinals, right? Or, or barons or lords and so forth, the princes and so forth. And then step by step to the layman, right? To simple clergy, then the layman or uh, the, pe the uh, citizens, right? Then the, lay, uh, the uh, peasants, the serfs, and so forth. So, in the Renaissance, this idea uh, collapsed. So, first of all, we understand that each person has the opportunity to have to run his own project of life. Of course, we don't mean that uh, the nobility really was dismissed. Of course not. But uh, the completely different attitude to history occurred. So history was considered to be represented by the means of eloquence and rhetoric and the same professor Sergeyev, which we have already mentioned today, said that poetry was only the first step in the development in the huge part, well, in the huge way of development of scientific idea of Renaissance and later the, mid, uh, the modern time. The uh, second part, uh, an important link between poetry and science in this, uh, in this line, we have rhetoric because eloquence was really something uh, as helped us, uh, as helped people to represent the historical idea. So when we speak, we start some time and we finish some time, right? So we speak word by word, as eloquent as possible, and we mean that those who listen to us, they understand us, and that we have uh, to be very understandable, but we have to be coherent, right, uh, in terms of, uh, of our speech. That is why we have to concentrate upon our memory, upon what we really know and what we really, uh, uh, really remember. That is why it was uh, one of the most important disciplines in the history of, uh, of uh, Renaissance was uh, the, ex the exercises of so-called the art of memory. For example, Giordano Bruno was famous for his ability to remember everything he knew, and he was very, um, how to say, he was very 
intelligent in this uh, uh, in, in this art, very uh, well trained. So he even was asked to teach the art of memory because when you remember the topic, right, you have to remember different examples, also from the classics, also from your own experience, and that is how you really develop the whole historical idea. So this is how you develop speech. As far as in poetry, we face with uh, the poetic word, which is important itself, right? When we read verse or when we read poetry, we understand that uh, the eloquence is uh, eloquence here is something which is worthy as itself, right? As a piece of art. In terms of rhetoric, we see that this is also the communication, and this is the possible link, a possible nexus between different people in terms of the common situation, in terms of the common ideas, and finally the common concepts, which uh, could be understood as the historical development. Later, uh, I think not the next time, but in a lecture I will uh, discuss the idea of, his of philosophy of history, which was, coined, which was uh, actually developed by the Italian, uh, late uh, Italian, oh, sorry, um, of the late Italian thinker, uh, oh Jesus, <laughs> I just forgot the name. Um, of course, Gian Battista Vico, right? And you will see that uh, the concept of history is very close to the concept of the human mind and the human spirit as such. And, of course, here, uh, as when we concentrate upon the final, the third step, which is scientific step, we have to remember that medieval time, oh, sorry, uh, the time of Renaissance, uh, it was the epoch when uh, we find the development of the scientific picture. So those people as Copernicus, Bruno, Galileo, uh, Jonas Kepler, Tycho Brahe, and so forth, really were the ones who tried to establish and elaborate the uh, scientific perspective uh, to the world, which was uh, which had the foundation, uh, so which had uh, the mathematics and really the physical approach to life as the fundament, right, as a certain basis of our knowledge. But uh, the very concept of worldview or world picture or picture of the world, as Martin Heidegger in his uh, famous paper Die Zeit des uh, Weltbildes uh, or the time of uh, the world picture actually uh, is very characteristic, uh, characteristic in terms of the Renaissance sculpture. So usually we say, especially in the Russian scholarship we say, uh, we say that uh, in terms of ancient worldview or in terms of medieval worldview, so factically uh, in terms of uh, facticity, let me say, it is completely wrong because there was not such a concept as worldview in Middle Ages, there was not such a concept, we cannot find this kind of concept in uh, antiquity, so this is typically uh, uh, the Renaissance concept because this was the period of time when first, uh, when people first, well, they really started to see the world as a whole picture. So what do I mean by this? First of all, I mean that uh, the very idea of perspective changed. I have already mentioned that the uh, reverse perspective, which we can find here, so this is the example of the orthodox icon uh, by Andrei Rublev, the Trinity, uh, which you can find in Moscow. Uh, you see that this is the reverse perspective, right? So what do I mean by re reverse perspective? First of all, that uh, well, in, in terms of this kind of perspective, we see that what we depict could be focused not in the picture, but outside the picture. So we are the ones where we have this focus of uh, the depicted thing or depicted person. The meaning of this is that when you see the icon, when you watch the icon, that means that the icon actually watches you, right? That is why you may pray. That is why your, your point, your, uh, how do you say, the point of view, right, uh, really shows you your place in the world. 
So by the place in the world, I mean that we have the outer world, the high world, in which we have, uh, the, well, we have God, we have the saints, right, the holy defenders and so forth. That is why this is the, um, the window to the outer world. So the possibility for those who live there to see this world, you see? This is the idea. Here, in uh, the Perugino's picture, the engagement of Joseph and Mary, you can see the completely opposite, uh, the, uh, the completely opposite picture, right? So, what we see in front is bigger than what we see in the back, in the background, yeah? So this is the idea of linear perspective, and you can understand that the point of view, and so, uh, we see the picture, we, we understand this picture, we consider this picture to be actually the window to uh, the world of uh, art, right? Not to our world. So, once again, I would like to emphasize this. When we speak about the icons and uh, the, whole, the whole cultural uh, of reverse perspective, we mean that this piece of art is the possibility to God and the saints to look here, to watch what we do in this world. When we speak about the classic art of the Renaissance, Perugino or Raphael or Leonardo or anything like that, we of course mean that this is the possibility of ours to look inside the picture and see a different world of beauty and to understand that this is the project of life and the artist actually runs this project in terms of creating his own universe. Right? in terms of realizing this idea of humanities as we are actually the microcosmos in, in macrocosm, right? Another example of uh, this ideal of ancient art, uh, which to my mind is rather illustrious, is the development of uh, anthropomorphic, uh, anthropomorphic sorry, um, sculpture. So here we can see and compare two sculptures one is the uh, Apollo of Belvedere, a famous sculpture of um, ancient Greece, and I believe that this is actually the copy, which was made in Rome, and now we can see it in, not to be mistaken, in the Vatican. <laughs> I think it's in the, in the Vatican. And uh, here we can compare it with the, uh, a famous sculpture of Michelangelo, so this is David. You can see that these sculptures are completely different to uh, for example, the Kings of Notre Dame's uh, facade, right? Because the proportions really play a crucial part here. When we see the Kings of Notre Dame's facade, we do not mean that the proportions are crucial because the art is symbolical. So what do we mean that by the Kings? First of all, we mean that they have the crowns, right? Uh, they must be huge. Uh, we can see that they are very... Uh, very Christian, let me say, right? Uh, that they are very pious. And here you can see uh, different uh, clubs, right? And uh, the crosses and so forth. But actually this is not the same as we have, uh, I mean, the figure of the kings is not the same as uh, the figure of the real person, really, right? But when we see the Michelangelo's uh, David, of course, we understand that this is the ideal man, right? The sculpture of ideal man. And, of course, this is, be this is uh, the development of idea, again, uh, of idea of humanity. So, we are really beautiful. We uh, the person must be beautiful, both from inside and outside. So, the more ideal, the more, the more perfect, the more beautiful one gets, one becomes inside, so the more clever, intelligent, the more talented he becomes, uh, the more actually beautiful, the more handsome, the more ideal must be the appearance, right? But at the same time, uh, this is the period uh, of history where Reformation and Protestantism take place, and uh, these concepts, and well, actually this phenomena, appears as a reaction to secular and clerical policy of the Catholic Church. I hope you... Oh, goodness. Uh, beg your pardon. I hope you remember the main, probably, people, right, uh, of uh, the Protestant period. So this is Martin Luther, the one who established Protestantism in Germany, right? 
The next person whom we must mention is Haldrick Zwingli, uh, the, well, his companion in Switzerland. And, uh, of course, we have to mention Henry VIII Tudor, the man who uh, really put himself even higher, on, on, on a higher position, comparing to the Pope in England. And you know that from the 15th, sorry, from the 16th century, the beginning of the 16th century, uh, the 20th, uh, actually, uh, in England we don't have the Catholic Church, but the Anglican Church, right? So uh, probably it could be interesting to note a famous, uh, and well, actually a really famous book by uh, contemporary anthropo uh, anthropologist Kate, uh, Kate Fox. Uh, she wrote a book about the Englishman, so uh, the title is Watching the Englishman. And he, uh, there she says that Anglic, uh, Anglic, uh, Anglical uh, uh, the Church is probably the least pious church in the world. Just because those who visit it, those who go uh, to the church on Sundays and so forth, they do it and don't think about God as such. They do it because this is only the civil ritual, the secular ritual, right? This is what they have to do as they go to work, for example, day by day. So Henry the Four or the Eighth, you remember, uh, tried to provoke uh, the Pope because he didn't get him uh, the permission to divorce with Anne Boleyn, but uh, uh, sorry, not Anne Boleyn, uh, but uh, his first wife, uh, Catherine, and it was really a problem to not to uh, make a new war and to establish the new church, right? You understand that uh, actually the uh, Pope was considered to be also a secular uh, ruler, not only the spiritual ruler of uh, the Christian world. And uh, that is why it was really important to uh, make the counterposition, the opposition, let me say, to uh, the Pope. And finally, uh, the person who was very influential in the, in, in the Netherlands, however, he, is, uh, a Frank, he was a Frenchman by his birth, uh, John Calvin, so these four people probably made the first, uh, the first row, right, of what we have as uh, uh, the Protestants. And for example, Luther said that do not call yourself Lutherans uh, if you think that I'm right. Please call yourself Christians because we believe in Christ, not in Luther. So what did they mean? I mean, what uh, was the main purpose of the Protestants? First of all, they said that they do not need any uh, transmi uh, transmissive instance, let me say. Uh, they do not need any medium uh, between the person and the God, uh, and God. So when we pray, for example, Luther and Calvin said that when we pray, we really speak to God. That is why uh, in, Luther, uh, in the Lutheran tradition, it is very important, uh, so there are two important points, two important theses. Actually, holy, uh, soli scripta, uh, uh, beg your pardon, soli fide, soli scripture. So that actually meant only by faith, right, only with faith, let me say, right, and only uh, with the holy scripture. So we can reach God and our, uh, really, our pray reaches God's uh, ears only because we can pray immediately to him, we can communicate immediately with him, and that is why you don't need anything like uh, the Catholic rituals, I can say, right? So they are not important. And also, it show, um, we can illustrate this thesis by the idea that uh, in Calvinism and Lutheranism, uh, people really can um, So they, they, they do not need actually uh, the priests as such. They need those who read the scripture and give the commands. And actually this could be any person from the society, right? Calvin also said that uh, as far as we have the idea of the original sin, so we are all condemned from our birth, so we are mortal, everybody dies, so we are all condemned either to hell or to heaven and nobody knows where our soul will get after the death. That is why it is very important to toil. It is very important to work as hard as possible here and on the earth. 
And if you are successful, you, that means that God loves you and you will get to heaven. If you're not successful, so you fail in every, in every activity you try to run, that means that God do not, does not like you. And that means that your soul probably will get to hell. Right? So this is quite interesting concept which um, started, uh, sorry, or which uh, Max Weber started in uh, the beginning of the 20th century. And he really wrote a very influential paper uh, entitled the Protestant ethics and and the spirit of capitalism, right? And of course, uh, here we can see uh, the opposition which Holy Catholic Church tried to establish concerning Protestantism. So, first of all, the Holy Inquisition, and this is actually a very typical phenomenon uh, of uh, the Renaissance period of time. I have to memor I have to revise you that there was not anything like that in the Middle Ages. So the first, uh, the Holy Inquisition was established in the late 14th century, uh, in the very beginning of the uh, 15th century. And you remember that uh, the 15th century is uh, the period of time which we considered to be the Renaissance time, right? The second position is so-called Counter-Reformation, where uh, they try to, uh, to establish the Catholic, uh, the Catholic belief, the Catholic Church uh, tried to uh, influence on the uh, so-called uh, Protestant countries, right? The, uh, Switzerland, first of all, then uh, some parts of Germany, of course, England, and so forth. And we, ha we can say that it was not very successful, really, because you know that there are a lot of Protestant countries in the world. And, of course, one probably of the most evil uh, traits uh, in terms of uh, the influence on the um, history of ideas and the very scientific spirit of uh, the modern age, so-called lib uh, Index Librorum Prohibitorum, or the Index of the Prohibited Books. So that was a list in which the Catholic Church really put, tried to put the main uh, authors who wrote uh, on scientific and philosophical uh, philosophical idea, uh, problems and the issues uh, concerning anthrop uh, anthropocentrism and uh, the very uh, idea of alchemy, right, and uh, science as such. For example, uh, Copernicus was also listed. Uh, Bruno, of course, was listed. Of course, in this index we can find Descartes and Bacon. After that, we can find the Alametri, a famous um, modern thinker who said that uh, a human being is a machine. Then, of course, we can find in this index uh, the whole tradition of the encyclopedists, uh, encyclopedists right? The, you know, with his head of Diderot and Rousseau and D'Alembert and so forth. So, in the 19th century, they started to put not even the books, but the authors as such. And Emile Zola, a famous French uh, author, said that this is because the Catholic Church uh, doesn't have time to read the books. That is why they just put this or that author, because uh, it could be potentially uh, dangerous, right? Not because somebody really thinks badly about Catholicism or something like that. So this is the slide that you know very well, and I hope you remember it from the last time. So here, uh, this is the place for, for it. So alchemy and hermeti uh, hermetis uh, hermeticism uh, is actually the, also the threshold. I could say the, uh, probably the deepest root of what we can call modern science, modern experimental science. So the word hermetism comes back to the name of, uh, comes, sorry, from the name of Hermes Trismegistus, uh, or Hermes three times great. So we don't know if this person really existed or not, but we consider him to be a famous magus, uh, a magician, uh, and the wizard of ancient Egypt. So uh, he really is the one who... Uh, so he was considered also the, uh, to be the author of uh, a number of alchemic treatises and alchemic books, even if he wrote nothing, he never existed actually. Uh, this was um, a very influential name 
a very influential authority, let me say, to trace the, alchemic, uh, the alchemical idea back. And uh, on the one hand, we find here the traditional authority. For example, we, have, we can find the same uh, in terms of uh, the works of fathers of the church or uh, the Holy Scripture, right? When uh, we know that, for example, Pseudo Dionysius uh, actually never existed, so he was the mythical disciple of St. Paul, but still, we know a lot of treatises named after uh, Pseudo Dionysius, that is why he's not Dionysius Arapagite as such, but Pseudo Dionysius in the tradition. So, Hermes is also one of the names uh, in this line, in this chain of tradition, but on the other hand, here we find the tendency to experimental science. So, you know that in alchemy it is very important the receipt, so, uh, the, uh, I mean the recipe, right? So do like that and the influence, so the result will be like this. So if you don't follow this step by step, you will never get the result. So it is very important, uh, I mean the subject is very important. On the other hand, when we speak about the classic experiment, the subject who does this experiment is not important at all because everybody can uh, repeat the experiment, right? So-called Citeris Paribus. So, by the certain uh, circumstances, under certain conditions, everybody can, exp uh, can make the same experiment and get the same results. That is why uh, here we find the very uh, example, sorry, the very first steps to this experimental tendency and uh, the important names which we have to mention here are Roger Bacon, R of Roger Bacon, uh, not to confuse with Sir Francis Bacon, Paracelsus, a famous medical uh, author and famous doctor of uh, the Renaissance, John Dee, uh, a man who is considered to be the first who really got uh, some, um, how to say, some um, pieces of gold in his uh, vessels, right? Um, with Nicola Flamel as such, and uh, many others. So I would also emphasize this idea. So alchemy and hermeti uh, hermeticism were probably the first steps in a high ladder, in the high stairway, the stairway of the uh, development of experimental type of science. The next important step of uh, the development of pre-modern science uh, the very pre-modern science, is the appearance of heliocentric system of the world, which actually was adopted by Copernicus, as I have already said. So, here we can see uh, the first model by Ptolemy, so-called geocentric model. So, here you can see a quite interesting thing. Uh, this is land, well, so this is the Earth, right? It is in the very middle of the universe. After that goes the Mercury, then the Venus, here is Sun, Actually, this is the place of Earth in heliocentric system, so we could compare it with the Copernicus's model. After that, we can see Mars, right? Then we can see uh, the Jupiter uh, orbit, then Saturn, and so forth. And I like it very much, so he's written Curlum Imperium Habitatum Dei, which actually meant so the place where God lives, right? Uh, the, the heaven where God lives. And uh, here is so this is actually the idea of the whole structure of the world, which traces back to the Aristotle's idea. Probably you remember the same scheme from the last lecture, right? We tried to uh, illustrate the idea of sublunar, sublunar, and superlunar worlds. So sublunar, the sublunar world is the world of motion, where everything moves, where everything develops, uh, everything changes, and nothing is stable. Nothing really. Uh, there is nothing ideal, that is why it is nothing perfect, right? So this is the imperfect, mo uh, imperfect world in which everything is in motion. But here we can see the metaphysical world where we have the, um, the very reasons, right, of the motion. So here God really lives because in terms of Aristotle, this is the place where we can find the primum mobile or primum mobile, right? So the unmoved mover. So somebody or something which makes everything move being stable itself, right? I hope you remember this idea concerning physics and metaphysics and we had uh, something like uh, some, something the same as the scheme, right? 
And well, this is actually the last slide. Uh, let us conclude uh, concerning everything we have already said. So, Giordano Bruno developed the doctrine of multiplicity of worlds and hylozoism. Well, actually, the term of hylozoism uh, is a very com uh, is a complex word, a combination of two Greek terms, uh, hule and zoe. Actually, hule means matter. Well, literally, to translate it literally, that means wood. Uh, so Aristotle didn't know the word matter because actually materia, as uh, a certain concept, was coined by Titus Chiarus Lucretius in the first century BC. So he was actually Epicureanist and not uh, a uh, peripatetist or probably uh, uh, Platonist or something like that, anything like that. So uh, Aristotle used the word hule, which actually meant wood. Uh, by this word he said, uh, he meant that everything has this kind of matter, the matter cause, right, uh, as he put it. So zoe in ancient Greek means life, so we know it from the word zoo, for example, right? So when we say that uh, everything in the world, so Giordano Bruno really thought that there are a lot of word, worlds and they are numberless, so we cannot even count them. We are not the only people, I mean, we are not, uh, we are not, all, um, we are not the only rational uh, beings in the universe, uh, and our world is just an example of uh, one of the examples, right, of many different rational worlds. So, Probably somewhere, Bruno thought. Probably that somewhere uh, that probably somewhere there live the human beings or the rational uh, beings, right? Who, who, who could think, who, who could communicate, who could uh, develop science, and uh, they have their own knowledge and so forth. And that is why he really thought that the universe is such, and everything in the universe has its own soul. Or he speaks about the world soul, or soul of the world. So. In terms of these ideas and concepts, uh, of course he was condemned by uh, the uh, Catholic Church, right? Because you know that uh, Catholic, the main dogma uh, of Catholic Church uh, concerns the, uh, that uh, the world is one, right? And the one who reigns is Jesus Christ and uh, Father, uh, Father God and Holy Spirit and so forth. And this is the Trinity. And uh, the idea of Hilozoism actually was very influential in the 17th century and the 18th century, uh, especially uh, in terms of pantheism. So pantheism really means that God is everywhere and nature is equal, uh, is, uh, equal to nature. So when we say nature, we say God and vice versa. By the, uh, this uh, influential, well, pantheism was actually very influential, especially uh, in terms of modern, such modern thinkers as Spinoza, Benedict Spinoza, who wrote his ethics and he really argued that God and nature is the one. Then we have to mention Bernardino Telesio, who argued on the importance of the empirical study of nature and demonstration. So he was probably one of the first empiricists in the history of thought. We do not speak uh, as uh, of the we do not speak about the Epicureanists or uh, I don't know the Stoics as the first uh, empiricists, right? because they didn't mean the same as we do by the word empiria and the word experiment as such, but actually Telesio probably becomes the first in this row, and I have to say that he was really very influential thinker, so a famous um, um, Tommaso Campanella who wrote uh, the next important utopia, so-called the solar uh, city or the city of sun, right? Uh, uh, he was very so he, he really agreed with Telesio that uh, we need the demonstration to understand that we really obtain the true knowledge and we have to be possible to show this uh, knowledge, right? We have to demonstrate what we really know. After that, uh, Francis Bacon, of course, got this idea and he really becomes the establisher of empirical tradition in the history of philosophy. So also Paracelsus, Leonardo and Andreas Vesalius became those people who lay the basis of modern anatomy, uh, anatomy right? So uh, when we think about 
Middle Ages, we of course do not mean that they were possible, it was possible to heal the diseases the same way as we heal the diseases nowadays or in modern times as such. Probably uh, this, so of course, well, even not probably, so uh, really it, it is uh, mainly because they didn't know anything about the inner system of the human body. So here you can see a famous picture by Rembrandt, uh, the class of anatomy uh, of the doctor. And here you see probably one of the first uh, pictures of the dead body. And you know that it was strictly prohibited to, uh, to try to interview into the corpse because uh, there is no soul inside because it's dead. And if, it's not, if, if there is no soul, that means that the study of the dead body, the study of the corpse, will never help us in terms of the medieval uh, doctrine it will never help us to heal the disease because when you are here or when you are diseased if you are ill that means that you are ill with your soul not with your body and well actually the body is uh, something that must uh, feel pain because this world is imperfect and we are dedicated to the perfect world and we uh, try to improve ourselves day by day because of our uh, idea of Christianity right because the idea of perfection so um, that is why Leonardo, Paracelsus and Vesalius really made a huge step in forward in terms of the development of uh, the anatomic and, of course, physiological uh, doctrines in medicine and in science as such. Also have mentioned, mentioned Machiavelli and uh, Giovanni Pantano once again. So they really started the principles of scientific organization of power I mean the state power and uh, the sovereignty uh, of uh, a certain country and a certain state, right, a certain government. And actually they lay the fundament and uh, the very basis of uh, the political studies. So we can find, we can trace the, ori the origins of political studies back to their works. We will discuss the ideas also later uh, in terms of uh, the modern attitude to politics and modern attitude to uh, the scientific organization of power. But I have to say that Machiavelli is famous also for his uh, concept of virtue. Virtue or virtu, actually in Italian, comes back, traces back to the concept of virtus uh, in Latin, which really meant, meant something, uh, 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 how to say, the higher, um, how, how to say it in English, right? The higher, um, Trace, trait of character, right? Um, the high possibility uh, of uh, the human being, let me say, right? The high quality of the human being. Of course, this is the translation into Latin of the uh, Greek term of arete. Uh, but arete, when the, the Greeks meant arete, they considered it to be the very common, the very vast and broad concept. For example, a knife or an axe also has arete. So if it is sharp, uh, and we can cut or slice something, right? Then this is the, uh, we speak about uh, the arete of the knife or the axe, or we can chop the wood, right? But uh, the, Machiavel the Machiavellian attitude to this concept of virtu or virtue as such is that this is the universal power which we find in history and each person and each state can obtain this virtue, can obtain this power to become the historically influential and historically important. And of course, Michel Montaigne, whose picture we can see here, uh, was probably one of the most interesting writers and one of the most important writers um, who developed the genre of philosophical prose, the essay. Uh, actually, he just published uh, Les Essais, as you can see it here, right, the book of essays. So, which literally could be translated as the experience, right? Uh, essay means experience. So, he was the first to write about himself. And even Voltaire said that this is a great idea to write a book about himself in order to show the whole character of the, man, the, character of the whole mankind, right? So, the idea of Montaigne was to get back to the wisdom of the ancients, on the one hand. On the other, to give a detailed uh, portrait of the, of the human soul, and actually he succeeded. So his essays became very popular, 
and um, I could just remember some people who were very inf influenced with this uh, piece of work. For example, our great poet Alexander Pushkin, uh, Rush, oh, sorry, uh, the French writer uh, Gustave Flaubert, uh, of course uh, Voltaire himself, and many many other people, many many other people who really uh, are famous for their approach to depict, to characterize the human being as such, right? And finally, we have to mention uh, the creators of the utopias, but we have already said about them once again, Sir Thomas More, Tommaso Campanella, uh, whom we, had, we have discussed, and Sir Francis Bacon, who actually wrote the New Atlantis, uh, also a very interesting text about the discovery of uh, a new island where uh, people, uh, people, um, uh, uh, people lead uh, a very just, and uh, <coughs> ra uh, reasonable, let me say, uh, very rational way of life. So this is actually this, uh, 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 the person who opens the whole tradition of modern ages along with uh, René Descartes. That's why we are going to uh, speak about him a bit later. So thank you very much for your attention right now and you're welcome with your questions.